Imagine that you're asked to remember the number 584. What could be easier? Whether you wanted to or not, the number would be yours to recall for the next few minutes. With the slightest effort of will, you could remember it at the end of this lecture, and if it were important enough, you would recollect it next month, next year, or next century. There's an American, I'll call him Henry M., who's been robbed of this precious power to remember, not partially and gradually, just by growing old, as most of us will be, but suddenly and almost totally by the knife of a well-intentioned surgeon. From Henry, we can learn about the nightmare of eternal forgetfulness, a condition that Franz Kafka would have been delighted to describe. Brenda Milner, at the Montreal Neurological Institute, has followed the case of Henry for more than 20 years. She once asked him to remember that very number, 584. He sat quietly, entirely undistracted, for 15 minutes, and to her surprise he could recall the number. But when asked how he did it, this is what he said. It's easy. You just remember 8. You see, 5, 8 and 4 add up to 17. You remember 8, subtract it from 17, and it leaves 9. Divide 9 in half and you get 5 and 4. And there you are, 5, 8, 4 easy. Henry lives in a world of his own, restricted not just in space but in time. Ever since an operation on his brain in 1953, his world has been just a few minutes long. Without such elaborate and fantastic tricks of rehearsal, almost everything slips from his mind like water through a sieve. Every moment has a terrible freshness. He never knows the day of the week, what year it is, or even his own age. Even though Brenda Milner has spent countless hours with Henry, she's an utter stranger to him, and on each new occasion that they meet, it's as if she were entering his transient world for the first time. He is, quite simply, unable to remember the new contents of his conscious experience. His general intelligence isn't at all reduced, and he's painfully aware of his own shortcomings. He apologises constantly for the absence of his mind. Right now I'm wondering, he once said, have I done or said anything amiss? You see, at this moment everything looks clear to me, but what happened just before, that's what worries me. It's like waking from a dream, I just don't remember. Every day is alone in itself, whatever enjoyment I've had and whatever sorrow I've had. Henry still remembers his very old memories and habits, but can't form new ones, and even has amnesia for things that happened in the years immediately before the operation. Three years before, his favourite uncle died, but Henry suffers the same grief anew each time that he's told of his uncle's death. In 1892, the German physiologist Friedrich Goltz described a similar loss of memory in dogs after the cerebral cortex had been damaged. They do not learn from past experience, Goltz wrote. They do not have experiences, for only he who has memories can have experiences. The decerebrated dog is essentially nothing but a child of the moment. Henry is a child of the moment too. He is trapped interminably in the naivety of infancy. We discover from this special case that our memories have two forms. One of them is quickly created, but fades within a few minutes, to be followed by a more persistent store, which can last for a lifetime. The most popular view is that short-term memories are converted or consolidated into the long-term ones. But the embodiments of the two sorts of memory must be quite different. Henry has lost the power to form new long-term memories, or perhaps he can make them, but has no way to retrieve them again. The injury to the brain of Henry was deliberate. When he was young, he gradually developed epilepsy so severe that he was unable to work. The surgeon treating him decided to remove the part of the brain that he thought was causing the epileptic seizures, an evolutionarily ancient part of the cerebral cortex called the hippocampus, meaning a seahorse because of its twisted shape, which lies tucked inside the temporal lobes of the cerebral hemispheres. The hippocampus had been removed on one side in many previous patients, but because Henry's epileptic attacks seemed to involve the whole of his brain, the surgeon destroyed the hippocampus on both sides, and that was the cause of his present terrible state. For the hippocampus of man is crucially important in laying down or retrieving long-term memories. Presumably, this surgical procedure will never be used again. 
Experimental brain surgery, which I shall discuss in a future lecture, is perhaps the riskiest form of experimental medicine because it's irreversible and its effects are expressed as changes in the personal experience and the behaviour of the patients involved. In the 1940s, as the epilepsy of Henry was becoming progressively worse, a Canadian neurosurgeon, Wilder Penfield, was gathering other evidence that the temporal lobes of man conceal the key to his memory. Penfield was also operating on epileptic patients, removing the areas of irritative damage in their brains. To guide him in pinpointing the epileptic focus, he used a method of exploring the human brain that has provided perhaps more evidence about its organisation than any other technique. He stimulated the surface of the brain with a weak electric current, not to damage it, but to excite impulses in the cells and fibres under the stimulating electrode. His patients were completely conscious during this electrical invasion of their minds. Only the scalp was locally anaesthetised, the tissue of the brain itself is insensible to touch, heat or pain. Penfield hoped to discover in each patient an area in the brain which upon stimulation would arouse the same curious mental aura that ushered in the epileptic attacks. That would be the spot to destroy, Penfield argued. And this approach was remarkably successful. But it also gave him the chance to discover the functions of other parts of the cerebral cortex. Stimulation of the touch area produced strange sensations felt by the patient in his skin. Excitation of the visual cortex made the patient see flashes of light or swirling coloured forms in his visual field. But when Penfield moved his stimulating electrode to the temporal lobe and the hippocampus itself, the experiences of the patient weren't mere fragments of sensation. They were whole episodes of existence plucked from the patient's previous life. The person would suddenly be transported into the past and would feel himself eavesdropping on a familiar scene. One of Penfield's patients was a young woman. As the stimulating electrode touched a spot on her temporal lobe, she cried out, I think I heard a mother calling her little boy somewhere. It seemed to be something that happened years ago in the neighbourhood where I live. Then the electrode was moved a little and she said, I hear voices. It's late at night around the carnival somewhere some sort of travelling circus. I just saw lots of big wagons that they used to haul animals in. There can be little doubt that Wilder Penfield's electrodes were arousing activity in the hippocampus within the temporal lobe, jerking out distant and intimate memories from the patient's stream of consciousness. Memory, its physical structure, is an unsolved challenge for brain research. In fact, it is perhaps the central question, rather like the problem of the structure of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, for molecular biology and genetics. But theories about the nature of memory have still not really progressed beyond the stage of description through analogy. Analogy has often been a valuable stage in the discussion of biological problems, but it is, of its nature, constrained by the technological development of the time, or the level of scientific knowledge in other fields. The restrictive nature of argument by analogy is aptly illustrated by historical models of memory. They're almost all based on the devices used by man himself to store information. According to Aristotle, sensory impressions entered the head with such force that they left physical inscriptions in the brain, like a scribe engraving on a wax tablet. This idea that the mind is a tabula rasa, on which experiences are literally written, was espoused by the empiricist school of philosophy. Let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas, wrote John Locke in 1690. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it with an almost endless variety? To this I answer in one word, from experience. Even current models of memory dwell on analogies with existing artificial methods of storing information. Mental memory has been compared with the magnetising of ferrite rings in the core memory of a computer and with the distributed image of a hologram, a device that stores a record of a three-dimensional scene through a process involving photography with laser light. Each analogy has a certain attraction, 
because it mirrors some particular special feature of memory. The permanence of lines scratched in a wax tablet or written on paper mimics the durability of real memory. The speed of access to the memory of a computer core is reminiscent of the remarkably rapid way in which neuronal memory can be consulted. Because the information in a holographic plate is distributed, when part of the plate is destroyed, a somewhat degraded reconstruction of the entire stored image can still be retrieved from it, and there's a similar phenomenon for the brain. The eminent psychologist Carl Lashley, working in the first half of this century, described a kind of resistance to local injury in the store of information in a rat. The actual representation of remembered events is almost certainly in the cerebral cortex, but Lashley found that small areas of damage in the rat's cortex simply blurred the animal's ability to perform tasks that it had previously learned. The degree of degradation of memory was roughly proportional to the area of damaged cortex. He concluded that the cerebral hemispheres have a kind of mass action in the remembering process. Lashley expressed his frustration in failing to track down the physical substance of individual stored remembrances in a famous scientific paper in 1950. I sometimes feel, he wrote, in reviewing the evidence on the localization of the memory trace, that the necessary conclusion is that learning just is not possible. Description by analogy seems less successful for the nervous system than for other organs in the body. The heart is like a pump in its action, and the kidney is like a filter because they are a pump and a filter. The analogies are both comparisons with other pieces of machinery and actual explicit descriptions of the mechanism of heart and kidney. But however similar in its properties mental memory is to a computer core or a hologram, the brain is not a set of magnetised rings or a laser-illuminated photographic plate. The value of analogy is that it provides rules, best expressed in mathematical terms, for accomplishing certain logical processes. The rules will restrict the set of possible devices that can accomplish the task. Unfortunately, the physical structure and mechanisms of operation in the brain are so unlike those of any piece of machinery made by man that analogies are usually weak. In any case, most theories of memory concentrate on the manner in which events can cause changes in physical structures. In other words, they're concerned with the machinery of memory, not the code, the symbolic form in which the events are registered. The printing of words on a page is a simple and efficient method of storing information, but it means nothing without knowledge of the language in which the message is written. Most theories of memory are, as it were, concerned with the question of ink and paper, and not with the much more fundamental issue of the grammar of remembrance. From this point of view, the most compelling theory of memory is the claim that remembering might consist of the synthesis of specific chemical molecules in the brain, the structure of each molecule representing a remembered event. This hypothesis is so powerful because it not only describes a possible physical substrate for memory, the synthesized molecule, but also embodies the nature of the code by which the information might be stored, the sequence of compounds in the molecule or its specific shape. Certainly long-term memory must involve some physical change in the structure of the brain. Consider the following classical experiment. A rat is quickly taught to run a maze or perform some other task. It's then cooled down to about 5 degrees centigrade for some time, stopping all electrical activity in its brain. When it thaws out, the rat, none the worse for wear, tries the maze again. With a fairly long interval between learning and cooling, the rat still remembers the maze. But if cooled within minutes or perhaps seconds of learning, it reacts as if the task were completely new. The necessary conclusion is that the initial storage of information, short-term memory, involves ongoing patterns of nerve impulses in circuits of nerve cells connected together by their fibres, while long-term memory is a lasting structural change in the pathway of cells. Some would say that this structural change is the synthesis of a substance that actually describes the remembered event. The theory of chemical memory even contains a strong analogy for it draws a comparison between mental memory and that other monolithic biological mechanism of remembering, 
the genetic code. The double helix of DNA is indeed a store of information. What it remembers is the exact chemical composition of the organic species it belongs to. It is quite simply a recipe for replicating the structure of that organism. And the sequence of nucleotide bases within the double helix is not just the structure of genetic memory, but is the code as well. The four different bases that constitute the nucleotide chain are letters in an alphabet. Each triplet of three successive bases forms a word that specifies a particular amino acid. The amino acids, of which there are 20 kinds, are assembled within the cell according to the instructions written in each gene to make a polypeptide chain, which folds into a protein molecule. It's these proteins that define the nature and form of each organism. In particular, the enzyme proteins determine the metabolic processes that the cell can perform. The structure of DNA proposed by Francis Crick and James Watson put flesh on the skeleton that Charles Darwin left in the Victorian's cupboard. It explains with such staggering simplicity the physical nature of genetic memory and the code by which it stores information. What Darwin had supplied a hundred years before was the other essential component, a way in which genetic memories could be forgotten. Natural selection is the mechanism by which only useful genetic memories are retained. It's difficult to exaggerate the importance of forgetting in mental memory too. The selection process that lets us store in long-term memory only a tiny fraction of the running contents of short-term memory is essential if the brain is to use particular instances to derive general principles by a process of inference. The Russian psychologist Alexander Loria has described a man whose memory seemed to have no limit, a mnemonist whose mind was so extraordinary that Loria wrote of him in terms usually reserved for the mentally ill. He could commit to memory in a couple of minutes a table of 50 numbers, which he could recall in every minute detail many years later. His greatest difficulty was in learning how to forget the endless trivia that cluttered his mind. In a remarkable short story, Funes the Memorius, the Argentinian writer Jorge Borges describes in fiction the alien totality of forgetlessness. A young boy, Ireneo Funes, had a fall from a horse and forgot how to forget. Borges writes, We, in a glance, perceive three wine glasses on the table. Funes saw all the shoots, clusters and grapes of the vine. He remembered the shapes of the clouds in the south at dawn on the 30th of April of 1882, and he could compare them in his recollection with the marbled grain in the design of a leather-bound book, which he had seen only once, and with the lines in the spray which an oar raised in the Rio Negro on the eve of the Battle of Quebracho. He told me, I have more memories in myself alone than all men have had since the world was a world. But what kind of molecules in the brain could possibly qualify as a repository of mental memory? They'd need to be complex and therefore large in order to have sufficient variability in form to represent the high informational content of each remembrance. In that case, the choice of appropriate macromolecules within the nerve cell is rather limited. They would have to be either proteins or the nucleic acids themselves, that is, DNA, or RNA, the ribonucleic acid that transcribes the message from the DNA of the gene and which actually assembles the protein molecules. But all of these substances, DNA, RNA and protein, employ logically equivalent coded messages. The series of amino acids in a protein contains identical information to the sequence of bases in the RNA on which it grew, and this in turn is simply a recoded version of the base sequence in the DNA of the gene. It's rather like the same sentence being expressed first in written words, then in Braille translation, and finally in Morse code. The information is identical. And so it is in protein, RNA and DNA. So in order for a wholly novel and unique protein or RNA molecule to be made for each memory, a new DNA sequence would have to be synthesized first within the actual gene. But there's no evidence that the DNA of nerve cells is continuously changing. In fact, DNA is virtually the only material that's not constantly being replaced in the living cell. 
The very permanence of genetic memory relies on the extraordinary stability of the DNA molecule. How can mental memory work by changing it? There seem to be only two possible solutions to this dilemma. Either the whole theory of chemical memory is wrong, or the existing, inherited DNA of the genes already contains the capacity to synthesize the RNA or protein that is used to represent any conceivable new remembrance. Each brain might contain within itself all the potential memories that it could ever form. Every event would merely trigger production of the appropriate molecule, which was already described in latent form in the animal's inherited DNA. This fantastic notion that every memory is innately within us in our genetic makeup is curiously reminiscent of Plato's nativist theory that all human knowledge is derived by the soul from a previous existence. In his dialogue Meno, Plato pictures a simple, uneducated slave boy, Meno, being interrogated by Socrates. By judicious choice of questions, Socrates drags out of Meno an account of the fundamental theorems of geometry. True knowledge, Plato argues, must be within us all, and learning consists solely of discovering what we already know. It's true that the genetically programmed wiring of the brain restricts the way in which each animal can act and even provides a vast repertoire of inherited automatic reflexes that allow it, without previous personal experience, to react appropriately to certain stereotyped situations that it might encounter. Built-in reflexes are the inherent knowledge of Plato. They're the behavioural reflections of genetic memories about the experience of earlier brains. But it's inconceivable that the empirical experience of each individual animal is actually represented by the synthesis of molecules. The expression of even innate reflexes requires the construction of nerve pathways that guarantee the appropriate response to the particular stimulus. The formation of personal memories must surely involve a similar transformation in the connectivity of the brain. What the chromosomes must store is the instructions needed to allow any circuit of nerve cells to change depending on its own activity, without specifying in advance which circuits will be involved. The ultimate chemical contribution to mental memory is then the genetically programmed ability to learn. The emergence of the capacity to learn is the triumph of evolution. Its first appearance must have been, quite simply, a transcendent step in the development of animal life. For learning frees the individual from the chains of his own double helix. It's the predictive power of learning and memory that give them such immense survival value. A primary requirement of any animal is that it should be able to anticipate changes in its environment. Inherited reflexes contain a static description of the events of high probability in the past experience of the species. But learning allows each animal to add a stock of personal secrets to its description of the probabilities of the world. To anticipate the future is the ultimate goal of the evolution of the nervous system. But since it works inductively, the brain can only base its predictions on probabilities drawn from the past. True clairvoyance, the mythical power of the soothsayer and teller of fortunes to predict future events without statistical qualification, would be so immensely valuable to an animal that its natural selection by evolutionary pressure would have been explosive. If any species had had genuine second sight, not only would it necessarily have spread like a flood through the gene pool, but also that species would rule the world. For this reason alone, the biologist must regard with extreme suspicion the claim that some individuals have extrasensory perception or true clairvoyance. And yet we do owe a good deal of our own biological superiority to our ability to plan for the future. There's no doubt that the evolution of intelligence has involved a gradually increasing power of prediction. In the back-to-front world that Alice found behind the looking glass, the White Queen actually lived in reverse. There's one great advantage in it, she said, that one's memory works both ways. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. And so it is. Our memory isn't quite the kind of bizarre predictor of the future that made the White Queen scream before her finger was pricked, 
But the biological, if not the aesthetic, value of remembering is not that it allows one to reminisce about the past, but that it permits one to calculate coldly about the unknown future. Just as individual memory has partly released each animal from the immediate restrictions of the genetic code, so the sharing of learned ideas by social animals has added an entirely new dimension to the progress of evolution. The spread of ideas through social groups of animals, which is so well developed in the primates and especially in man, allows the experience of the individual to become reflected in the behaviour of other members of the same social group, even those in later generations. This is truly the social inheritance of culturally acquired characteristics. In 1953, on the Japanese island of Koshima, a female macaque monkey called Imo, a genius amongst monkeys, invented a method for cleaning unpalatable sand from the sweet potatoes that the group of scientists observing the monkeys had been scattering on the beach since the previous year. She dipped each potato into the water of a brook with one hand and brushed away the sand with the other. During the following two years, this habit of washing potatoes spread to 90% of the members of Emo's troop. Only the youngest infants didn't know it, and the oldest males steadfastly refused to adopt it. By the sharing of ideas, animals, and most especially humans, pool the ability of their group. The pinnacles of intelligence are exploited by the entire society. In human culture, this has led to the emergence of a kind of communal intellect, the collective mind of man, that has pushed forward his biological progress at a prodigious rate. At first, the cultural transmission of human ideas must have been by imitation or demonstration, as it is amongst monkeys, and later by word of mouth. Such methods of transfer are subject to the opportunity for progressive distortion, like that which characterises the spreading of a rumour. And hence, all the conditions would exist for a kind of evolution of ideas. The variability which genetic mutation gives in Darwinian evolution would be provided by the regular contribution of individual new ideas and their distortion in cultural transfer. The natural selection of these ideas would be made on the basis of their utility. In general, useful ideas would survive because they would propagate themselves, just as an adaptive genetic mutation flourishes. In effect, the evolution of ideas in the collective mind of man has virtually brought true natural selection to a halt. The ability of man to manipulate and plunder his environment has steadily grown, at the same time that medical skill has almost vanquished the forces that put pressure on the biologically undesirable elements of his genetic stock. Many biologists, including Jacques Monod, have expressed their fears at the dilution in quality of the human gene pool. But that's not all we have to fear. The present status of humanity is in fact a stalemate between the forces of conventional evolution, which threaten to punish us for breaking beyond the bounds of our biological rights, and our collective mind, which battles to preserve our present status. What we should be most afraid of, perhaps, is the fact that since the invention of printing, magnetic tape and computer cards, the collective mind has lost the vital ability to forget. A principal task for us lies in the organisation of knowledge for ready access. This problem is nowhere more acute than in science itself, where the sheer accumulation of facts threatens to impede rather than to assist the progress of new ideas. Already the technology that supports everyday life in the developed world has become so complex that no single mind can understand it. Man might not go out with a bang of his own creation, nor freeze his race to death by stealing the energy resources of the earth. He might simply drown himself in a flood of information. Society could collapse because it no longer comprehends its own cultural inheritance. The code of the collective mind the medium by which ideas are transmitted by man is human language. That's the subject of my next lecture.